Thank you. Well, good morning. It's, um, it's a distinct pleasure to be here. Um, what I'm really going to do is tell you about a journey um, that we've been taking in the United Kingdom and just to refer to some of my experience of visiting other countries. I think, first of all, I should explain my role. Um, I am a rheumatologist by training, uh, but in 2006, um, the government asked me if I would apply for the job of National Director for Health and Work. This is not a civil service appointment. It is an advisor to the government, and I report to two departments of state, to the Department of Health, the Department of Work and Pensions, and I have a responsibility to the Health and Safety Executive, which is the regulator for safety uh, within the workplace in the United Kingdom. The reason the government decided it needed to do something was because of the rising number of people who were leaving the workplace because of either musculoskeletal conditions or mild mental health conditions, so depression, anxiety, and stress. And these two things had been ever increasing. And the result of that was an enormous burden into our benefit system. I won't bore you with the complications of the UK benefit system. We have over 40 benefits. But just to say, it was leaving us with far too many people not in work who could have been in work and far too many people in our benefit system and musculoskeletal diseases were one of our biggest challenges. So they thought it would be appropriate to have someone who tried to get two departments to work together, which is unusual in the United Kingdom. Our departments tend to work in silos. Um, and the realization that work is a social determinant of health we think smoking is a determinant of health. We all agree with that. But we were not used to thinking at home that work determined your health status, that being in work on the whole is good for your health. Being workless is extremely bad for your health. And the fact that neither health professionals, employers, trade unions, or indeed the government had ever thought that way before. So for us, this has been a big, a big step, um, I think very much in the right direction. And now I've gone around the world. Um, I was in Australia at the beginning of the month for the Australian government. I was in Hong Kong last week for the Hong Kong Health and Safety um, Council. Um, and I've been very involved in the movement in Europe, uh, Fit for Work. I'm very aware now that many governments around the world are linking health and work together. And if you want a highly productive economy, if you want people to be engaged at work, then you've really got to link health and work together. So I think that is really important in, in sort of telling you um, why I'm doing this job. And, uh, and I do not, of course, have an occupational health background. And they purposely decided not to have someone with a, an occupational health background. I had been president of our largest medical Royal College, the Royal College of Physicians, and they decided that therefore I knew the profession, which is true. And as one of our most difficult challenges was persuading our family doctors to consider this to be important. Therefore, they thought it was useful to have someone who knew how the profession worked. So, and just perhaps one other thing to say, my appointment was at the time of a Labour government, and we now have a coalition government of the Conservatives and the Lib Dems. It hasn't changed the importance of this agenda. If anything, our new government um, is trying even harder <coughs> to link in um, health and work an example of that, our new Secretary of State for Health, um, Andrew Lansley, has set up a public health um, responsibility deal, as he calls it, and in there he has put um, work and health and occupational health. So we now have two departments of state, <coughs> including the <coughs> excuse me, the business department, which is called our Department of Business and Innovation is also deeply involved. So it is at last cross-government, which is so very important to us. 
So, I mean, the overall goal that we have, I, I think it would be shared by you, is we want people to be healthy, we want them to be engaged so that they can really give 100% at work. We want them in well-managed organisations. I discovered as I've been doing this work that we appoint our managers for their technical competence, not because they understand people communication. So in some of the more delicate areas, they haven't received the right training in the United Kingdom. But if we get those two things right, I think we have a high performing and really resilient workforce, and we need that desperately with our economy at the moment, we will get better productivity. I think it does also contribute to a stable society and a better economic performance. We feel very strongly that people with chronic conditions and disabilities must be part of this goal. So we must not be excluding people with chronic rheumatic diseases, chronic mental health conditions. They need to be part of this. I said at the beginning that we didn't associate work with good health, um, but it's been around a long time. So Galen, uh, a long time ago, said employment is nature's physician. It's essential to human happiness. But people always say, where's the evidence? Um, so in 2006, Wardell and Burton uh, brought together in a report, a report that looked at the evidence. Not all of it is class one evidence. Some of it is, is more anecdotal. But overall, it shows that work is generally good for your physical and mental health and well-being. And for too long, people with chronic diseases have been kept from work, often by discrimination, but sometimes because people have low expectations, including doctors. Sometimes I would sit in a rheumatology clinic. It would be as easy to say to someone, well, are you finding it difficult to get to work? Perhaps, perhaps early retirement would be useful. I realise now that was absolute rubbish. I should never have said it. And quite frankly, I think I was a bad doctor. Um, I mean, that was not the way to help my patient have a full and functioning life. So there is good evidence and, um, and, and that is important. The two secretaries of state who appointed me asked me to look at the health and well-being of the working age population. It was an independent review. I'm working for a healthier tomorrow. So it was a, a report to government and they therefore had to respond. They accepted all the recommendations and what we've been doing over the last two years um, is trying to put this into practice. And they asked me to try and identify the things that kept people from work. What were the things that were in the way and what could we all together, not just the government, do about it. So I was trying to prevent illness and promote health. I wanted some early intervention and then I wanted to improve the health of those out of work so they could go back to work. What does it cost the United Kingdom? Um, these are 2007, eight figures. Well, it's £100 billion a year. It's a huge amount of money. Last year, the running of our National Health Service was £106 billion. It is the same cost as running the whole of the NHS in England. That is a huge amount of, of money. So many days are lost uh, to sickness and there is an enormous cost to our economy. That's the financial part. The social part is the effect it has on the individual who's leaving the workplace, the effect on their family and the effect on society. And just looking at the literature um, that I could find on children who grow up in workless families, um, they are five times more likely to get mental conditions than those who grow up in a family where someone works. And in a British study um, published in the BMJ, then children who grow up in workless families are 13 times more likely to die in a road traffic accident or in an accident in the home. Now, you could say it's not cause and effect, but I think there is a, there is a relationship. This is the, um, the challenge in the United Kingdom. In the green box are people who are either in work or are collecting their sick certificates, the certificates that enable them to collect statutory sick pay, or they're at work with a health condition but doing well, they're in work and they are in good health. 
We want that box to be as big as possible. Our problem, as I said, is that the other two boxes have been getting too large. So the box where people are not in work, do not have a job, but are looking for work. They are our job seekers allowance, so they're looking for work. They might be healthy with no job. They might have a health condition with no job. The people in the purple or, or lilac box are people who are in our long-term benefit um, system. And they have been ever growing. Nothing the government has done in the last 10 years has really reduced that box. Some people come out of it, but just as many flow into it. That is an unsustainable situation um, for the United Kingdom. You may have seen in the papers, it's all over the papers at home, we are in for a radical reform of our welfare system, um, which is really extremely uh, radical, but the reason is um, on this slide. And I said in my report that the number of people in our benefit system represented a historic failure of both healthcare, Department of Health and Employment, the Department of Work and Pension, to address the needs of the working age population. And that is still true, although we're trying to change it. So what did I find that stood in the way? And I don't know whether some of these things would be true here in your own country. A lot of attitudes and beliefs that needed changing. And that is difficult. It takes time to change culture and beliefs. So the idea that you need to be 100% fit to be at work. But if you're diabetic, you probably want to be in work, but you may not be 100% fit. So this concept of how do you enable people to be in work supported by the employer who are not 100% fit. Most of us aren't 100% fit um, all of the time. I'm, I'm sure we're aware of that. We have medicalized this to an absolutely ridiculous degree at home because we know that many people may have on their sick note um, something that is medical, but we know behind it there are psychosocial problems which we need to address as well. Managerial attitudes, very inadequate systems. I wanted to get rid of our sick note and have a fit note, which had to be a change of the law, which is now being done. We needed an early intervention service. We needed to train doctors, healthcare professionals to behave and do things differently. And our local arrangement for health delivery, um, primary care involvement was totally inadequate, as was, uh, were our occupational health services. And we spent little attention to building um, the resilience of our next generation, who were going to be the next generation of workers. So a lot of problems for us to address. This is, I'm pleased to say, the old note. It doesn't exist anymore. It had been there for 80 years. Not many things, I can assure you, in the British government last 80 years in health untouched. But this had been the same note. And it either the doctor had to say you were 100% fit or 100% unfit. It was a binary note. There was no partial ability to work, could not be considered. Now, that was really very old-fashioned and inappropriate, and it needed to be changed.